Amen. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father, in Jesus' name, we're so grateful to be called by the name of Jesus. Father, we're grateful today that you meet us right where we are, that we don't have to clean up anything or change anything, Jesus, because you are the God of change. You are the God of transformation. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to be with us this morning and to do in us what only you can do through the power of your blood. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> First, I have to thank Pastor Adam for inviting me. You know, um, every nation church, you are so blessed to have your pastor. You guys know that, right? Can you give him a hand? Amen. <clears throat> And he's so humble, it's the last thing he wants to do is even be mentioned, but you've got to give credit where credit is due, you know? And, and I want to encourage you all to pray for your pastor. Pray for your leaders. Because prayer moves mountains. Prayer moves God and God moves the mountains in everybody's lives. So we just thank God for Pastor Adam. You know, we, we all know that in Matthew 10, 30, it says the very hairs on our head are numbered. And uh, you, you saw that uh, a video up there when I had more hair. And, and I, I know that God can add, but since I've hit 72, I know that God can subtract as well. <laughs> <coughs> These 70s are no joke, I have to tell you. Um, coach John Earl Madden, who still holds the highest winning percentage for any coach with 100 who coached 100 games or more said this. <clears throat> he said, the core of building a successful team is to make everyone around you jealous to be just like you to perform at their highest level. <clears throat> and we know that the Apostle Paul was, was also encouraging us to have mentors in our lives. And, and he said in 1 Corinthians 4.15 and 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, to basically be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. So, so mentors in the kingdom of God and in every aspect of life, whether you're a professional in business or in sports or whatever you do, people that you can look to as an example for what you're seeking to accomplish in your life are vitally important. <clears throat> We know that um, there are godly examples in Scripture, like Paul, first of all, like Jesus, who set the way for us, who lead us in paths of righteousness so that we'll have examples to follow. <clears throat> if I was going to take Coach Madden's saying and change it, I would say this. The core to building a successful team is to make everyone around you jealous, to be just like Jesus in you and to perform at their highest level in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus is first in our lives, loved one, <clears throat> there is no other, there is no second. There is no second best. That's why when Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and, and what it means in the original languages, and then everything else we need to continue to seek God first becomes God's responsibility to add to your lives. <clears throat> Faith gets God's attention. But obedience activates God's power. Let me say that again. If you, have, if you take notes or anything, please take notes today. Every time I go anywhere and listen to anyone speak about something that might be important in my life, I always write things down. Tony Robbins years ago said one good thing that I liked. If life is worth living, it's worth writing down. <clears throat> Faith gets God's attention, but obedience activates God's power. And this is what James meant in James 4, 7, when he said, Faith without works is dead. In Jeremiah 29, 11, the prophet's encouraging us all to have faith in God's good plans for our lives. 
In 12 and 13, he says, when you, when you activate faith, when you come to God believing that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, then, then you, you position yourself to receive the goodness of God in your life. You position your heart by faith to receive the riches that God has for each of us in our lives. And, and, and when we seek God with all our heart, when we search for him with all our heart, God has promised we would find him. You know, I, I love how the Bible uses infinitives. I love how the Bible uses the word all, all the time, always. And every time you read that word in the Old or New Testament, it's exactly what it means. And sometimes you might not feel like you're giving thanks all the time, or you might not feel like you're all in. And I would just encourage you when you, when you read these infinitives to just stop and pray and ask God if there's anything in your life that you need to repent for, turn away from, turn to God, anything in your life that might be holding you back from the full measure of God's all in your life, from the full measure of God's fullness for your life. I'm going to read Matthew 5, 43, 44, and 48. If you have Bibles, you can join me, or I think it'll be on the screen thanks to our amazing audio department. Amen? <laughs> amen. Give them a yes. Amen. <clears throat> These are the words of Jesus. We know because they're in red. I like it simple. So Jesus says this, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. <clears throat> But I say to you, love your enemies and praise, pray for those who persecute you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Think of the magnitude of what Jesus is saying. It's so impossible. Anytime somebody comes up to me and says, you know, Pastor Rex, everything in the Bible is just so difficult. And I go, well, you know, just wait a second. How about everything in the Bible is impossible? And, and God makes it that way on purpose because we know that there is nothing impossible with God. And, and so the more the more we confront God's word and the more it intersects with, with our hearts and with our lives and we see that it's impossible, it causes us to humble ourselves and to radically cry out for Christ and Christ alone. Amen? <laughs> Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And, and, and there, Jesus is not talking about perfection as the idea of being sinless. Rather, Jesus is talking about the, the, the emphasis falls on a close and committed relationship with God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I'm going to share with us today just some of my life and some of my experiences. And, 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 and my wife has been married to me for 32 years, so she knows how radical I am about God and about the things of God. But I, I think all of you will be encouraged that if God can use someone like me, he can use anyone. If God can transform someone like me, he can transform anyone. And that's what the message of Paul was all about, too, when he said, said, hey, I'm the chief of all sinners. And, and yet look at how God can use me because of my surrender, my humility, my radical commitment to him. So my wife and I were out on a, a date night the other night, and we went to a movie, and after the movie, we went back to our car. And, and when we went to the car, you know how you just go for your car keys and you don't even think about it, and you just put your hand in pocket, but the car keys weren't there. So I, I'm thinking, well, gosh, wait a second, I'm checking all the pockets. And, you know, even if you check the pocket once, you check it again, you know, because you just can't believe that it's not there. And, and so I thought, well, well, honey, maybe it's still in the movie theater. We went to a theater because it was a date night, right, that had the reclining seats. And, and I thought maybe the key fell out of my pocket. And, and I, I kind of knew it didn't, but I'm hoping against hope. You know, I'm in good company because Abraham did that, too. And so, <clears throat> and so... I went back into the theater and everybody was so sweet to me and they pulled up the chairs and they looked underneath and there were no keys and there was this random guy still in his seat. 
This is long after the movie's over. <clears throat> and he said, excuse me, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm looking for my keys. He says, don't worry. God's going to help you, and everything's going to work out fine. <laughs> I, said, I said, okay, Lord. I, I, I mean, I, I hear you speaking to me. This is, it's all good, Father. <clears throat> so I'm going to have faith today, God. <laughs> so I, I walk back out to my wife. I, she says, oh, you got the keys? I go, no, honey, I don't have the keys. I, I said, but we're going to have to take a cab home. But I said, Joy, everything's going to work out fine. And she just goes with me at this point. She goes, okay, honey, okay, okay. So, so we get in the cab, we go home, and, and, and I say to her in the cab, I say, honey, you know, I don't know why, but I, I think God didn't want us to drive home today. She says, that's kind of obvious. And so, <laughs> I, sometimes I can be obvious, you know. <clears throat> and so, so we go home, and the night's over, and then, and then uh, I call one of my spiritual sons the next day who owns a garage, and he turns me on to a guy who can come and make a key for me. So I call him up, and he meets me at the car. And when I get to the car, I realize that over the in practically half of the driver's side of the car is either somebody either vomited or it was chilly or it was just something just horrible and nasty and this is a miracle my first reaction was hallelujah hallelujah now i know why god didn't want us to drive home because he wanted me to pray for this person you see that's a miracle that's a miracle. But that's what God is looking to do in each of our lives every day. If we will walk in a place that's connected to him, if we'll walk in a place filled with his love, filled with his forgiveness, then he will give us his perspective on the circumstances of our lives. Amen? Amen. In the past, I would have gotten so angry at this because I was the angriest person to ever walk the face of the earth. But in Matthew 5, where it says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that just came alive in me. And when the word of God is in our minds and in our hearts and it, it, it circumstances, we have to confront circumstances in order for God to take that word and make it revelation. To, to cause that word to, to actually activate in our soul. And that's exactly what I realized had happened. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't respond this way all the time. I mean, my computer crashed the other day and I did not respond this way. <clears throat> but, but in this particular instance, I did. And I realized there was such a, a, a freedom and such a liberty that I was experiencing that rose me up above the circumstances to walk in a place that was so connected to the person and presence of God. And I realized that John 8, 36 was alive in me. When, when, when Jesus said, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I realized, wow, this is what Jesus is promising us. This is what Jesus is talking about. That, that in the middle of any circumstance that might be designed to tear me down, when I acknowledge Jesus first, when I seek him first, when I put him first, he's ready to release and empower me in the Holy Spirit that I might walk in liberty and that I might walk in freedom. Not my idea of it. I don't have a good idea. But God's idea of freedom and liberty, which is walking in his perspective. I'm going to share with you for a, a moment now my, my testimony, some of my story, my personal story, where I've come from and, and how I've gotten where I've gotten and, and, and where I'm going. And, you know, the beautiful thing about Jesus is that, that, that he leads us from glory to glory and faith to faith. And, and we might respond in, in such a supernatural way with Christ and we might be sensing the presence of God in our lives and yet we never arrive. It's always a process, right? 
We're, we're being led by God, and we have these moments of triumph and victory, but, but Jesus wants to be alive and in the midst of all the small practicals of life that no one else sees. And, and that's really the key. When Jesus is alive in those practicals, then he'll be alive when the big things happen. Don't wait till the big things come and think, oh, then I'm going to surrender to Jesus. Then I'm going to submit to Jesus. Because, folks, it just don't work that way. Take it from experience. So I was born in New York. My father was a, a very famous commercial actor, maybe at the time one of the most famous commercial actors in the world. He was the original Juan Valdez on Colombian coffee commercials. And he had a diplomatic passport, and, and they didn't search him when he would go in and out of Colombia where they'd film the commercials, and he used to smoke, smuggle cocaine and emeralds back into the States. And he started getting me high on cocaine when I was 12 years old. And, and he, he led a very broken life himself, and it's sort of like the computer terminology that says garbage in and garbage out, and, and, and he didn't come to Christ himself at that point, and so he thought this was a way to bond with his son. And my parents were finally divorced when I, when I was 14. Um, my parents had just had my beautiful, amazing sister, Melissa, who is 14 years younger than me. And, and, and she would, had just been born, and, and they got a divorce. And my mother instantly remarried a man named Arthur Stein, who was an alcoholic, atheist Jew, the trifecta. And, 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 and one day I was with Arthur and, and, and he just hated me so much and, and he looked at me with his hatred in his eyes and, and I, I looked at him and I said, Arthur, why do you hate me so much? And oh, he had an answer immediately ready and he said, because you look so much like your father and I hate your father. And I thought, oh my gosh, how do you, re how do you recover from something like that, right? So I remember walking away thinking, I don't think this is going to be a very fruitful relationship. So sure enough, at 16, he threw me out of the house. Uh, and, and at that point, I was so filled with anger. I was so filled with resentment. I was so filled with unforgiveness. I was so filled with bitterness. I thought, how could this be happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? And, and all of those attacks from the enemy of your soul started to flood my life and started to shape my perspective and started to influence my thinking. You know, the enemy has been, been following you around for, for since you were children and he knows exactly how to get your attention, how to create chaos, how to masquerade his thoughts behind your thoughts and, and to make his thoughts look like they actually belong belong to you. And then when, you, when you're thinking negative thoughts and thinking things that are destructive, if you actually think they're yours too, it makes you feel twice as bad. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God comes that we might have abundant life over and above anything we could ask or think. This is our God. Hallelujah. So I went, uh, I graduated high school only, they graduated me only because uh, my teacher said, we just can't afford to have you back here. It's too, uh, too chaotic, you know. <clears throat> so I said, well, whatever it takes, you know. And I went off to college, to a, a junior college on the border of Arizona and, 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 and Mexico. And that's where I started dealing drugs and, 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 and they, the, 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 some of the feds that were confiscating drugs would kick them back to me and a few others. We would deal them on the campus and, and kick them back money. And, and that's where I, I started to realize, well, Anything is fair game as long as you don't get caught. <laughs> and, and then I, I got thrown out of college because I did some just unspeakable things. And I, I mean, I was a disaster. When I tell you loved ones, a disaster. 
And, and I got kicked out of college, and my father said, if you come back to New York, I'm going to break your legs. I said, I guess I'm not going back to New York. And I went to California, and I started dealing drugs out in California, and then my father lost the commercial, Terminal Ego. And, and he came, and I invited him to California, and we became drug dealing partners. And so he had been, in, he was from, from Cuba. I'm Afro-Cuban on my father's side and I'm Jewish and European on my mother's side, which is why I go to every nation church. <laughs> <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> and, and so uh, uh, my father came out to California. We became drug dealing partners and eventually he got us involved with the Cuban mafia. And, and, and it was just a nightmare. And, 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 and then I had a drug overdose. I was uh, uh, at a party and somebody told me that one bowl was cocaine and the other one was something else, but they, they, they wanted to try to kill me because these are the kind of people I was associating with. And I had this overdose which left me brain dead. I had a complete emotional and nervous breakdown. And it was so bad that I, I remember going to a psychiatrist afterwards and he said to me, do you know, son, do you carry a wallet? And yeah, I always carried a wallet. He said, write down your address and put it in your wallet because you're going to forget where you live. And when you forget where you live, maybe you'll open your wallet and you'll pull it out and, and you'll, you'll, you'll remind, it'll trigger something you might remember where you live. And, and so I was a disaster. And, and, but, but I realize now that when I look back, God was moving even in the midst of that turmoil. And one of my favorite life verses is Romans 4, 17b. And, and it talks about uh, uh, Abraham. And it says, even God who gives life to the dead and calls things into being from things which do not exist. And, and I love the fact that we serve a God here today. That regardless of what you've gone through, regardless of what you're experiencing now, regardless of what the people you love are going through or experiencing, God doesn't need a track record of victory in your life to bring forth his victory, his freedom, his deliverance, his power, his authority. That's, who, that's the God we serve. And that's always so exciting. Um, I was doing a, a drug deal and shortly after this drug overdose and, and somebody tried to rip me off and they came in with guns and, 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 and tried to steal the drugs and tried to steal the money and, 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 and it was just a, a real disaster which, which led in the, in the guy who came in hitting me over the head with the gun and a, a lot of blood and, and I, I went and grabbed my gun. He ran out, he thought he had shot me and, and I ran after him. We were shooting at each other in the hills of Beverly Hills and the blood's in my face and, and then I hear this voice. If you don't get out now, next time you dead. <laughs> And it scared me. It was as if it was the first time something really scared me. And I remember this, this shot of adrenaline shooting from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And, and I was a disaster. And I remember just dropping my gun to my side. And he's still shooting at me. And turning around and walking back into, into, my, into my house. And all I can think of was that, as I look back, God must have had an angel with a catcher's mitt behind me catching those bullets, because I don't know why he didn't shoot me, but, but, but God knows what he's doing, right? Thank God that he knows what he's doing, even when we don't, and many times we don't know what we're doing. It's just a matter of humility and surrendering to the truth of God's word that leads us out of darkness into the light. Amen? amen. Come on, church, you can say amen. amen. It's okay, yeah, well, I do, I mean, it doesn't have to be quiet in here for me. Can't you tell already? I'm a wild man for Jesus. So... So one day I'm in my bank and there's this girl in the bank and we start talking and I used to rob banks too but I wasn't robbing this one and 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 we were we were in, I was in the bank and she said to me oh do you know Jesus and immediately I thought to myself hmm the Jesus I know I used to buy drugs from I don't think that's who she's talking about 
Jesus. No, no, it wasn't you. <laughs> and she says, she says, well, I want to invite you to a meeting. Uh, a woman is going to preach. You'll come to this meeting, and, and you'll hear about Jesus. <clears throat> and i got to be honest, folks. Transparency, full transparency. I didn't want to know about Jesus. I wanted to see her again. But you know, God knows just the right bait to get your attention <laughs> when it's time to change your life. And so I went that week, and, and, and I saw her there and we, we went and sat down this woman came out and she preached about Jesus and about God's healing and delivering power and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, and, and I thought man this is so theatrical and she said well I'm going to go up for prayer come with me and I said well let me just think for a minute so she got up and I'm thinking to myself and this is the unredeemed mind of, of man right I'm thinking well how am I going to put my moves on her later if I don't get up and I don't go and get in line. She's not going to, you know, I'm gonna, that's all I'm thinking about. And so, so finally I decide to get up. And when I decide to get up, it was wild. It was a wooden pew. And, I, I, and all of a sudden I decide to get my legs lock. And, and, and for a moment I just start to sweat. And I sort of say, what's going on? I'm out of control. Oh no, what's happening? And, and then I, I try to get up again and I get up and my pants had gotten so wet they made a ripping sound on the wooden pew. And for a moment I looked down in horror thinking my pants were going to be there. I mean, I was a disaster. And so I get in line and she's all fresh like a daisy. And I'm dripping like a rat. And so, so she goes, oh, Jesus is touching your life. And I go, what are you talking about? And she says, just stay here and Patty Damas will pray for you. That was the preacher there. So she goes up for prayer. I go up and Patty, this little woman, looks in my eyes and she says, oh, you don't know Jesus, do you? And I go, no. No. She says, she says, well, can I pray for you? I said, if you must. And she says, okay, Lord, I just pray that you would remove the scales from this man's mind. In Jesus' name, that he would see you. Simple, nothing happened. I said, great, can I go? She said, yes. I said, Pam, I'm, forgive me, I'm not going to drop you off tonight. I'm going home. And so I just left and I went home. And that week, Pam would call me every day and read the word of God to me. And she read the prophet Isaiah to me, which says God's ways are not our ways. God's thought are not our thoughts. As high as the heaven is above the earth, so high are his ways and thoughts above ours. And something clicked in me. Uh, she invited me back to this meeting the next week. And something had clicked in me and I said, wow, you know what? Maybe, maybe I always believed there was God, but maybe if his ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts, maybe I don't know who he really is. And so I came back the following week and, and incredibly, I gave my heart to Jesus. And, and God started to move in my life and then things happen and, and I came, how much more time do I have? Okay, great, thank you, thank you. I'm notorious on the time thing. So, so I came back, uh, 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 I received Jesus, and, and then my, my mother started going through very difficult times with my stepfather. She said, can you come back to New York? I came back to New York, and, and, and I realized one day as I was in prayer, I, I was praying these, you know how we pray these big prayers? Like, oh God, I want to be just like you. And, and, and God will answer that prayer, so be careful if you pray that prayer. And he said to me, okay, son, forgive your father. I said, no, no, it must be the enemy. And, and so, so I, I, I said, God, I, you know, I, the only thing I want him to do is just tell me how sorry he was for messing up my life. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit just impressed on my heart. And I said, ah, and, and, and God impressed on me and said, well, yeah, okay, son, but, but I know you can't forgive him in your own strength. But, but, but I'm going to place the same forgiveness that I've shown you through the power of my blood, through the power of my cross, and through the power of my blood, power of my cross, through the power of my Holy Spirit, I'm going to transform you <clears throat> so, that, so that you will be able to forgive him with my love and my forgiveness. So I said, well, we're talking miracle here. So, so every day in my quiet time in the morning, I'd get up around 5.30 and pray. And every day in my quiet time, I would pray that prayer, God, help me to forgive my father the way you've forgiven me. And almost a year to the day, almost a year to the day, 
I was praying that prayer and the Holy Spirit said, it's done, the work's done. I didn't feel any different. But my father was in California, I waited for the time change, called him up, <clears throat> and you know how certain people in your life can push your buttons and you go nuts? <clears throat> and family has got the key to those buttons. <clears throat> And my father could make me insane in about three minutes. So I, I called him up, and he started with his stuff, and, and, and nothing was happening. I thought, oh, this is really different. And it was interesting, because after a few minutes, when he didn't see me responding the way I used to respond, his whole tone changed. His whole attitude started to change. And so I hung up the phone that first time, and I just danced. I was, oh! Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Woo! Jesus, I'm free. And I was just so excited to be free. You know, when God heals us, he heals us from the inside out. You know, the world says life happens from the outside in. What you look like, how much you weigh, all of that stuff, and then what you think. Just do it. You can do it. You don't need anybody or anything. It's all about you. And then there's nothing really of the spirit. But God deals with the spirit man first. And, and when he does something to transform us, it's from the inside out. And he, and he touches our spirit man, gets our spirit to align with his through the power of his word and his promises. And then that informs our thinking where we're able to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And then that informs our emotions, which are always doing their best to try to sweep us away with their own energy. And then those emotions come under the word of God, under the spirit of God. And then our outward man is the last thing to be touched. And, and, and when it's like that, nothing can steal those changes. Because the, the, the world can't steal what it hasn't given you. So, and God is not an Indian giver or a man that he should lie. Amen, church? <clears throat> so, I was transformed. And, and shortly after that, I went to California. My father was, 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 was struggling with his health. And I went to California, and, and he came up to me. And I had given up needing him to say he was sorry. And he came up to me, and he said, Son, nobody knows the transformation in your life like I do, because no one is responsible for messing you up like I am. I went, what? I said, Dad, I've forgiven you. He said, I know you have. And he said, I know that this Jesus you're serving is the real, true, only living God. How do I get him in my life? Hallelujah. And so I prayed with him. We wept in each other's arms. I took him to uh, a church on the way. My spiritual father was a man named Pastor Jack Hayford. And, and he ordained me, ordained my wife. He was the head of our prison ministry for decades and, 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 and poured into us. And, and, and he, 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 he water baptized my father. My father got the second baptism. There is a second baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of tongues and the prophetic. And it's something that if you don't have have it today if you want it just we're going to pray in a minute and just ask God don't hold back anything from God God has never held back anything from you and he wants you to be filled he wants you to be immersed in his Holy Spirit he wants to empower you because it takes true power to walk out this Christian life I mean this is a God has called us to a radical Christian life love the Lord your God with all your heart all your mind all your soul all your strength and then you're able to love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's that all, it's that radical approach that God's called us to. And we're never too young, we're never too old, we're never too far gone. Things are never so restricted by circumstances that they ever disallow the entry of God's power into any situation. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Is this good? Praise God. Give God praise. Come on. Hallelujah. God's doing something. Faith is alive in this church today. Come on. And that's all God needs to position our hearts to do something dramatic and transformative. So, as I said earlier, I've, I've been married for 32 years to my amazing wife. And, and, and when we got married, though, it started on kind of a negative foot. And uh, her dad didn't like me, and I, you can't blame him. I mean, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't saved at the time, I don't think. And when I shared my testimony with him, in his mind, he thought, 
save my daughter! <clears throat> and as a result of that, he didn't even come to our wedding and walk his only daughter down the aisle. <clears throat> and on the surface, that might sound dramatic and harsh, but he was trying to make a statement to try to save his daughter. So, I understand. And, 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 and now today, <laughs> I just, I, I just chose after that to just love him the way Jesus loved me. You know, God builds line upon line, stone upon stone, precept upon precept. Uh, what he did in my life with my real father, I was then able to take and apply to my stepfather who threw me out of the house. I don't know if he got saved or not, but then to my father-in-law as well. And I realized what a privilege to love him the way Jesus loves me. That, that every, every obstacle and every challenge and everything that creates chaos is a privilege for the Christian. Loved ones, it's time for our perspective to become God's perspective today. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And so I, I started loving on him and now he calls me his pastor. Come on. This is the miracle power of a living God. Um, my wife and I are in uh, prison ministry. We have a ministry called Prison in the Wild, and we go into the prisons and, and, and minister the love of Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And we, we share this with men and women and, and, and correction officers. We have a four-phase ministry program that God has given us over the years. The first phase is the Alpha program, which is a program that, that introduces people to the, to the person of Jesus and, and, and helps disciple them through the process of becoming more like Christ. Uh, the second one is a re-entry format. And when people are in jail, two things happen. They either beat the case and get out, and we have a re-entry format that helps them with jobs, places to live, uh, a community for their family, um, and, and, and anything they might need to go forward so that they don't commit another crime. That's how we break recidivism, which is the, the, the definition of re-offending. And then if they, if they if the other thing happens and they lose their case, we don't want anyone to feel abandoned. So we have a whole program also to minister to them, to give them a sense of identity before they go upstate, to know that they're not alone. And then the, the third phase is a, uh, 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 an advocacy phase where we, we stand and advocate for those who, who need an advocate between them and their attorneys and their cases, because many times people are so confused about what they're charged with, and they're not even sure of how to deal with what's going on. And then we have a fourth phase where we minister to correction officers because we realize that if they're not doing well, how can that not negatively impact the people they're in charge of? Forgiveness in Christ defeats all of Satan's schemes. Let me say that again. Forgiveness in Christ defeats all of Satan's schemes. First, we need to receive Christ's forgiveness for us. That's the prime, that's where it starts. 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's anything that would stop active living relationship with God. Secondly, we need to offer Jesus' same forgiveness to everyone and anyone around us. And we know that, that we are living the Spirit-filled life, the Spirit life, when we are quick to forgive. And, and, and you know, I, I realized a long time ago, I said, Lord, what is a good definition, a good illustration of humility? And, and Jesus said, Jesus, or maturity in the faith. And, and the Holy Spirit impressed me and said, you know, you're always going to get knocked down, but you never have to get knocked out. The Holy Spirit said, you'll get knocked down, Rex, but the less time you spend on your back on the mat, the more you know you're growing in relationship with me. And so most of the time now I get knocked down and I'm up. And, and that's what God is calling us to. That, that, that perfection be perfect as I am perfect, that intimate relationship with God that keeps us on our feet so that when we've done everything to stand, what? We are still standing. Isn't that good news, church? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to wrap up in a moment. Um, uh, Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Um, Peter says to Jesus, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus basically says, Peter, 70 times 7. In other words, you do everything 
to align yourself with God, which means you keep on forgiving, regardless of what it costs you. It'll never cost you as much as it cost me. Because as long as we keep the cross and the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus in front of us, we'll always be able to forgive, we'll always be able to love, we'll always be able to rejoice at all times, regardless of the suffering we're going through. And I know that many of you have got serious circumstances and situations that you're going through today, and God is not minimizing it. He's saying, I want to take you through it. I want to be your comforter. I want to be your healer. I want to be your deliverer. I want to bring you through whatever you're going through right now so that you know you're never alone. God's forgiveness for me, when I get past my own hurts and failures, um, uh, opens me up to believe and receive that God will forgive through me. In other words, in other words we have a tendency to be trapped in performance. And, 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 and everything about our lives is about performance. The, the moment we're born, the little baby cries. He knows he gets something to eat. We get a little bigger. We go to school. We do well in sports. We get a letter. We, we, are, we do well in, in our grades, and, and, and our teachers like us. We obey our parents, and, and we get ac or a parent or whatever, and, and, and we get accolades for that. We graduate. We go to college. It's, it's SAT scores. It's performance, performance. We graduate college. We go into the business world world or we go into sports or whatever we're in and it's performance we're graded on our performance and then we come to Jesus and he says no 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 I've done everything already on your behalf it's not about performance with me you got to drop that mentality when you come to me and I will show you what it is to be more than a conqueror I have already won all the battles on your behalf. I've already become sin for you. He who knew no sin was made to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> he became a curse for us. And so, and so when we come to that place, <clears throat> then we receive that there's a tremendous freedom and a tremendous liberty that takes place. God's forgiveness is eternal in Christ and releases eternity in me. Let me say that again. God's forgiveness is eternal in Christ and releases the sense of eternity in me, in us. In Matthew 6, 12, it says, Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those, as we forgive our debtors, those who have trespassed against us. And, and it's not that Jesus is saying, if you don't forgive, you can't be saved. Because, because then no one would be saved. But what he's saying is he's highlighting the fact that if once you're born again, <clears throat> if you hold on to unforgiveness, you restrict what God wants to do in you. And God is a jealous God. And so he wants... He wants complete intimacy with you. He wants the fullness of life that Jesus died for to give each of us. Amen, church? Amen. Forgiveness in Christ stops Satan's plans. And, and, and I'm going to close with this scripture. 2 Corinthians 10, to, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12. But, one whom you forgive, but to the one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also, Paul says. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Here he was modeling the person and presence of Jesus for them through forgiveness. So that, here's the reason he did it, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So Paul was saying right there in, in, in the word of God that, that, that if we don't forgive the way Jesus has forgiven us, we open up a door to Satan <clears throat> to hold us back <clears throat> from everything God has for us. And, and, and I believe, I, I believe this too, that when we don't forgive someone, we tie them up and hold them back as well. Church, can I pray for us right now? Yes. Would you all stand to your feet, please? <laughs> Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. 
We love you, Lord. Just start thanking God right now. Hallelujah, Lord. If there's anything in your life you can thank him for, you can thank him for the blood. Father, thank you for your blood. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit. Lord, your word says in Luke eleven thirteen that if our earthly fathers who were wicked knew how to give us good gifts, how much more would our heavenly father give us the Holy Spirit if we would but ask and keep on asking. Right now we ask for the Holy Spirit to come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And with eyes closed and heads bowed as we're worshiping God, there may be someone here today or, or, or even someone who will listen to this uh, uh, via video who may not have ever said yes to Jesus, that first step, who may not have ever said, Lord, Lord, I, I want to confess my sin to you today. I want you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and cleanse me of anything that's holding me back. And with everybody's eyes closed, if anybody here uh, fits that, just raise your hand right now. Amen. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. Lord, thank you. And, and right now we're going to pray. The word of God says that if we confess Jesus with our mouth and believe that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so right now, church, as a community of faith, you're, you're surrounding some of these people who just are making this decision for Jesus today. Can we have everyone in the church pray this prayer after me? Say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood on my behalf. Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I humble myself before you. I give you my sins. I give you my life. And Jesus, I ask you, come into my heart. Be my Savior and be my Lord. Make your word alive to me so that I might live the victorious life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give God a hand clap. And, and, and now quickly, I, I just want to say that, that there may be some here today, just close your eyes for one more second. There may be some today here who have been holding on to unforgiveness. There may be some here today who just want to say, yes, Jesus, if you could do this in Rex's life, you can do this in my life. If, if you can transform him, if he could walk in this victory over circumstances that are chaotic, I want to walk in victory over the chaos in my own life as well because I believe today, Jesus, that you walk on the, on the water. You walk on the water of my life. You walk on the waves and you walk on the storm of my life, Jesus. And so if there's anyone here today who wants to, to, to walk in this deeper, mention, deeper dimension of forgiveness, this, this, this deeper dimension of intimacy and relationship with Jesus, just with eyes closed, just raise your hand. Amen. Hands are going up everywhere. Amen. 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 Yeah, if you just say, I want more of Jesus, just raise your hand. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. Keep your hands up now. Keep your hands up, Lord. We just pray right now that, Lord, you said, how much more would you give us the Holy Spirit if we ask and keep on asking? Right now, Jesus, I speak a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit over church, over this community of faith, God. Right now, God, I pray that those who need to forgive would, would, would know your forgiveness for them right now in an intimate way as they've never known it before, and it would create a sense of liberty and freedom inside of them, God, that would release them to forgive whoever has hurt them, God. And that today as a church, when we do leave this place, Father, your Holy Spirit goes with us, God. And that we would be able to forgive whoever might do anything to try to sow seeds of chaos in our lives, God. And as we forgive, Father, we would, we would acknowledge and we would lift you up. And Jesus said, if you be lifted up, you would draw all men unto yourself. So so that's why we live today, God. We live to lift you up and that all men might be drawn unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so, Father, we thank you for these things and we give you the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen, Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
<laughs> hey, wasn't that a fantastic message by Pastor Rex Duvall? You know, I, I was both uh, challenged and provoked, and yet uh, when he spoke about forgiveness, I know he, he hit a chord uh, in people's heart uh, in our church, and I pray it did for you as well. And uh, listen, while the sermon's over, we're not quite finished. I'd love to remind you that you can be faithful in your tithing and your giving. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart that those that have been uh, faithful in your tithe and support of Every Nation New Jersey. Um, uh, if you would like to uh, get involved with our, our big give uh, giveaway, our special offering this year, uh, please, uh, in any of the, the ways you give, just put in the memo, uh, big give, and you can be a part of what God wants to do to bless the world. And so whether you're, you're giving your tithe, or our special offering, uh, there's three ways you can do that. You can go to our website, encnj.org, and just hit the giving icon. Uh, or you can give via text. My family and I give this way. It's, it's a very convenient way to give. If you just test, uh, text the letters ENCNJ to the number 77977, um, uh, you can do that. Or you can simply mail in your check or money order right here to our church offices at 101 Gibraltar Drive, right here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. Every nation, Jesus loves you, and I think you're amazing too. Uh, have an amazing week.